latitude prevailing winds and ocean currents, mountains and the nearness to the sea. Things like that determine what we call the climate, determine what the climate of a place will be. Welcome to Cambridge Zero Climate Talks with Antoinette Nestor and Amy Munro. How is your week? Sort of very stormy weather, but we still went out for a walk and we had to yes. stand up under a tree. And of course, we got soaked. But yeah. the, the children loved it and they were running and they were playing. So you have to see the positive side of things. Ah, oh, that sounds good. Um, so, who have we got this week? So, this week I had a very interesting conversation with many students, in fact. And this is because this past week, the 12th of August, it was International Youth Day. And in order to highlight youth voices, this week we decided to bring you some of their voices into the radio program. So I spoke to Oscar, Emily, Bruno and Tabitha, together with Marina Velez from the Cambridge School of Art, and we discussed art and sustainability. I also spoke to the year 12 students who won the competition that we run together with Downing College as to how climate change affects their chosen field of study at a third level. So I spoke to Berlin, Simi, Sharier, Kiara, Allen, and Mariela. And we had a very interesting conversation and very good chat about all these issues. So because of the students' conversation were much longer than what it would allow for a radio program, we have expanded podcasts in relation to this. So keep an eye on our social media and we'll let you know when this podcast will be available. And I also spoke to Luca Marassi from Earthwatch Europe and we spoke about plastic pollution in rivers and much more. This is Cambridge Zero Climate Talks. I'm here with students and recent graduates, Oscar, Emily, Bruno and Tabitha and Marina from the Cambridge School of Art. So would you mind all of you introducing yourselves to our audience? So Oscar, I'll start with you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Oscar Stanley. Um, I'm a photographer based in Cambridgeshire. My practice is based around around uh, environmental issues and landscapes and so on. Hi, I'm Emily Bowers. Um, I've just finished studying children's book illustration um, at Cambridge School of Art, and I'm hoping to get some work published soon. So, um, I'm Bruno. I, I studied fashion design. I graduated as well recently. And my practice is uh, based on well-being and mental health. I'm Tabitha Wall, and I'm in my going into my third year of illustration and I'm very passionate about um, including sustainability and environmental education into my work. Hello, I'm Marina Velez and I'm the organiser and curator of the Sustainability Art Prize at Anglia Ruskin University and I work with all these uh, lovely students. Excellent. And now we hear more and more about sustainability and in all areas, in businesses, in what we do. What about in relation to art? What is sustainability when it comes to art? So I'll, I'll keep the same order. So Oscar, would you like to answer that question? Um, it's a quite a difficult question in the sense of how broad sustainability is. So within my work practice, I try and bring it in with issues like deforestation and things like that. So sustainability is quite difficult to sort of comprehend what the term means sometimes. But um, I think everyone has a different, has their own meaning of what the term is. But um, with my art, it's, it's trying to keep, it's not always making the image look beautiful or appealing. I try and make it show the harsh reality of what's going on in the world. Um, it's quite, sometimes quite depressing the way um, you have to work, but also you've got to make a lot of connections, make sure people understand what you're photographing or what the meaning is, rather than just a personal issue. And how do you incorporate sustainability into what you do? Um, so I include much of so the deforestation, I show the process of the woodcutting and um, things like that. And Emily, same question. What is sustainability? So I think 
sustainability for me um what i tend to focus on at the moment is environmental um sustainability and i think how i sort of incorporate it into my work is through narrative so it's kind of trying to find the right balance between expressing these issues um but without it just feeling like a very negative um overwhelming experience and trying to um, provide ways that we can help Um, because with working in children's books I don't want to just sort of create a lot of climate anxiety for um, young children so it's kind of just trying to find a way where you can ignite that drive to create change but without it just being a negative experience. And for you, Bruno, I mean, you, you are the fashion design and a lot of people, they are more conscious, perhaps, about sustainability in the fashion design and well-being. So what is sustainability for you and how do you incorporate it into what you do? So as they, they, they have been said, it's a really difficult question, essentially for me, uh, because the fashion industry is one of the, more, the most polluted ones. Sustainability for me is based on balance within the world. Uh, try to create change to fight, let's say, um, anything that can damage the the planet we live. Also, like within other areas of sustainability, like perhaps myself, like I've been working well-being because I've been dealing with a lot of experiences in my life that it's like about depressions or bullying or Uh, subjects like that and I think like using fashion as a way of um, showing and speaking about these themes just try to make awareness of them as well like I know that environmental sustainability is really important but I also wanted to focus a bit of well-being and like balance and all of those subjects as well within my practice um, so basically Because I'm fashion, I have to try to reduce the amount of fabric. I have to try to keep it as less waste as I can. So my garments are all oversized and all the patterns are um, geometric shapes. So more about rectangles, squares, triangles. So in that way, I can still waste less material and fabrics and try to help the environment as well. And for you, Tabitha, what about no, the, same, the same question? What is sustainability, what it means for you? And how do you incorporate it into what you do? So I think part of the problem with the climate crisis is that lots of the issues are very repetitive. So forest fires come every year. And I think that can be, for example, for the, for the public, they can experience like compassion fatigue. And I think art and illustration can really help to sort of shine new light and engagement on issues that you know otherwise can become quite repetitive so in my work that's what I really try to do is pinpoint issues that can that through illustration can sort of be exaggerated and become a bit more accessible to people um in my own work I try really hard to use recycled materials I suppose so in my eco side posters that meant going to the charity shop and buying some secondhand books and destroying them and um, using say molasses and bits of recycled plastic and ice and things that so actually one of my final pieces I could just put in the compost after it had been used photographed Um, and that's really important to me rather than using lots of harsh glues and things that can't just be easily disposed of after I finished with my piece. And what about for you, Marina? What about sustainability? How do you incorporate sustainability into what you do? I mean, you you organize the Sustainability Art Prize. So can you tell us more about this art prize? Um, yeah, the, the art prize has um, it's been running for, for, for many years now. And it's, um, it's, uh, although it says it's a prize, it's a, it's a sort of follows the model of the competition, it's a co-curricular activity, so uh, to embed uh, sustainability into the curriculum. So, um, so um, this, uh, uh, this the sustainability art prize it creates a space where these uh, discussions can take place. So where um, uh, students from different disciplines in the creative industries and, and 
in the art school can uh, have discussions about these entanglements and about what is sustainability, the different aspects of sustainability, and, uh, and uh, also how to incorporate sustainability into their own creative practices. But um, also some, some students uh, gives them the opportunity for, for them to realize that they might be already working on themes of sustainability without actually knowing uh, and, and how to put all the, how to link all these uh, all these issues and make sense of, of the practice. So that's the sustainability art prize. But you also asked me, you know, what is sustainability? Mm. And for me, the sustainability is, uh, is cultivating the capacity to respond to the problems that we're facing. So uh, this, the idea of responsibility and, and also as Don, Donna Haraway said, to stay with the trouble. So I invite the students and the, uh, you know, to, to just talk about these diff difficult issues and st to stay with the trouble. And, and to be honest, it's just showing immense capacity for um, uh, response, response that are very creative mm -hmm. to, to those troubles and, and to work within these entanglements that sometimes are very difficult to navigate. So for me, that's, that's, that, that's uh, sustainability that's in the creative industries. And, and as we, we have seen from, from their works, uh, Emily, Bruno, Tabita and Oscar, um, they, they all show in different, different ways of, of um, looking at a good stewardship of, of the planet, of Gaia, eh? and, and making kin with one another and, and radical uh, care, radical caring. Um, and also um, there's a lot about social and ecological justice. Uh, so discussion about these big topics that can be also when you put narrow them down to a personal level and personal experiences, uh, they touch people deeply because they are involved. And all of you, before you started your career as artist in all these different media, did you think about sustainability that much or was it something that started to evolve as you started to learn more and more about what or how you could incorporate your ideas into the current uh, world situation of everything that is taking place. So Oscar, was it something that you started that you had in mind before you started your course in, in art or was it something that developed? I'd say environmental issues have always been a concern of mine. I never felt that it would take me to where I am now in my art practice. I wouldn't say, I'd say it's evolved from starting with um, nature, not nature photographs, but photographs of plants natural forms then it's it, then it evolved to uh, having concern about not the welfare but the actual um sort of the existence of plants animals um and humans ourselves and the fact that we are destroying what we love in a way um what many of us love it's um yeah it, it's definitely evolved I, I wouldn't say i ever started my art form saying that i'd end up doing environmental art but it's yeah it slowly evolved to what i do now and what about you, Tabitha? How, how did it all start? And was it something that developed? I have always had sustainability at the root of my education. From the age of 11, I was involved in Plant for the Planet, which is an, um, an organisation. And I, I was part of a school that went to other schools and trained other students to be climate ambassadors. Um, and that alongside after leaving school being involved in the climate strikes and direct action with with different um climate i don't know say extinction rebellion i was part of um for a long time and still to this day but i think my artwork has really gone alongside that and i think art is really powerful in bringing across messages um and i also i sort of knew that that was something that i've always wanted to do because I was um, vegetarian at from birth and that was quite an unusual thing um, 15 years ago so I was always aware of like standing up for things that I believed in and it's it's been something that I've definitely looked forward to sort of honing and using in my creative practice as a professional and what about for, for you Bruno 
Um, so for me, it just developed through the years. I've been studying fashion for six years now. And in the beginning, uh, I was only 14. So I didn't have much awareness of sustainability and the pollution side of the world. So within my education, I start to understand what is sustainability and how to apply to sustainability. So, and also like as my, I want for my practice to be like, a way of showing what's going on in the world as was like a performance or such a con like a conceptual pieces so it's like a way of me telling people who are not aware a story and like showing through garments and all of those things so it's i think it built up as well as my knowledge about sustainability it was evolving through the years and what about for you Emily, was it something as well that evolved or was it just always there? I think it's something that's always been there. I think um, since, I, since I can remember really, I've always been interested in making things and also really, um, really into nature um, and animals. And I think it probably started becoming apparent that the two were kind of coming together when I was doing my GCSE art, um, where I'd sort of always look at the relationship between humans and nature and how we are all animals and all part of the same thing, but the world seems to separate us. Um, and then I took probably five years out from education, I think. Um, and in that time, I wasn't really making art pieces or anything like that. Um, so I was doing some sculptural work before. Um, and I think that's kind of when I started to step back and think about things. Because when I used to make things... Um, as part of my A-level art or anything like that, um, it would always be sort of trying to make a statement or get people's attention and be like, look at this, that's happening. Um, but I think becoming more aware of how quickly things are now appear appearing to happen, or as scientists always say, it's happening, but no one's, you know, in the governments and things in the world, no one's really sort of making that change. Um, it's kind of, I think my focus is more turn towards how can I get help get that information out to people um, to kind of make it may actually help be part of that turning change um, and I think one thing that's always just like looped through everything I've done is storytelling um, and how you know if if there's sort of um, sort of characters in not they don't necessarily have to be sort of animals in a human way or anything like that. But if we can sort of really connect with our empathy with, um, you know, the creatures in um, my book, for example, um, that will really sort of help us engage with something. But I think one thing that I've really learned from being part of the sustainability art prize is just how far sustainability as a whole crosses over things. Cause I think I always just thought of it in um, terms of the natural world and, you know, protecting our planet, but I hadn't really realised it'd sort of cross over into social aspects and different areas like that. So that's been really eye-opening and I can see that being part of my practice going forward. So, yeah. And in an ideal world, what would you like to see in your area of work and perhaps in the world overall? Yeah, well, I'd love for there to be more diversity in, um, in work and in the work that people produce and in the way that we sort of respect and respond to work from across the world i suppose lots of say children's books can become become quite sort of um not samey but there's very repeated messages and things about you know plastic in the ocean but actually i think there are lots of much bigger issues that could be addressed um and that children aren't necessarily taught enough about um so i'd, I'd really love for uh, the future to see lots more children's books and education into living sustainable lives and standing up for things and standing up for other people as well as yourself um, and I think that that's very possible to do through art because art is a massive foundation in children's education and children's books as well yeah what about you Emily what would you like to see in the future in this ideal world Sort of a little bit of what Oscar was saying, actually. I think the pandemic's given me a bit of time to reflect um, on my own 
practice and where I'd like to go personally because the course was so fast paced that it was you sort of like make 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 go 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 and it sort of give me a bit of time to settle um I think a big thing for me is um I just remember when I was at primary school and we'd have um visitors come in to talk about um you know if it was wildlife photography or anything like that and you sort of be like wow you know that and it really sort of like ignite your imagination and um create an excitement about things and I think if I could provide that for some children that would be um really amazing uh, as my personal journey but I think in terms of the world I'd like to see it's I think just less suffering would be amazing for um you know animals and people as well and Bruno what about what about yourself the same question what would you like to see in an ideal world I would say balance unity and respect talking about world and like people as people like I think respect unity and balance in a way of coming together as Emily said um trying to face a problem without let's say fighting against each other like people can think of great things and uh, like solutions if they come together like teams make it perfect without yourself sometimes you can't think you every, any the every detail you can forget something about my practice i think in fashion is a, almost the same thing respect for the environment balance within trying to reduce as much pollution as the industry of fashion does it's more also about fast fashion like i think consciousness needs to be <clears throat> bring uh like brought to these these uh small market areas in the fashion business it's going to be a long way in the fashion industry because fashion is just like a lot of the fast fashion brands they see one day in the next week it's it's out already so it's a way of finding solutions to reduce um chemical pollution to reduce fabric waste all of those things within the fas like fashion sector, I would say those three words will be the my key ideal points for the ideal future. And what about for you, Oscar? Not the same question again. How would you see you know, your, your ideal world and anything that you would like to see within the world, basically? Uh, I think the emphasis on the education side, like educating people at a younger age about issues, I feel that's probably... Oh, it's really been discussed quite a bit. I think that's quite a big factor in what I want to see. Obviously, the younger you start it, the more understanding they'll have on these problems and issues, but showing more of like a diverse um, spectrum of issues rather than just focusing on, let's say, one like, um, de well, only a couple like deforestation and like bigger areas or um, like greenhouse gases and emissions and things like that. I think there needs to be more of a diverse um, spectrum of, issues otherwise i think children feel like there's only just one problem well it's actually more than they think but ideally i want to see um people understand these issues more and have more of an understanding of what they are and what it means for the future and marina so do you think that all these issues that we talk about i mean you know, we always mention children do you think they're being polarized you know for example do you think that climate change is one way or the other sustainability is one way or the other and sort of we tend to focus on the big problems rather than for example the everyday what's your view in all this well uh, for instance the sustainability art prize if you look at it as an exhibition and if you experience this uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a group exhibition as it that it is it's a, it's a project that is a you know different artists and um, uh, and students responding to different issues, you can see that some, uh, some art practices zoom into the everyday and they look at the small things and some others deal with bigger narratives and bigger uh, uh, questions. So they, they are very important uh, in both ways. So that they, you need to be asking the big questions, but you also need to make, make them human and uh, relatable. Yeah. I was thinking about your, your question about the, the future and, I, and immediately I thought, well, we need to have um, 
art, artists and art practitioners and creative practitioners in decision-making uh, bodies. Uh, we need to have them in the government. We need to have, them. so particularly artists working uh, with themes of sustainability. Uh, we need to, you know, we, we need to move from, from having, uh, keeping an, as a society, keeping art practitioners and creative practitioners in a very precarious situation uh, and to give them a proper place in society because of, of our contributions. Uh, so uh, academic, uh, you know, practice-based academic research is very rigorous, very serious, and it has contributed so much. It needs to be incorporated in decision uh, making uh, bodies. Yeah. Indeed, I know we could that actually develop a whole conversation about art and the role of art in government and regulations and policies, but I think that would be a good thing for, for, an, for another day. So is there anything else that any one of you would like to say before we finish? Just, 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 mm-hmm. just to, uh, to tie up all the, the things, mm-hmm. you know, um, in different, these diverse practices, we have uh, Emily uh, is exploring new ways of publishing that are, um, you know, perhaps publishing on demand or crowdfunding and uh, doing uh, works with schools and councils where these coastal uh, towns where these uh, ghost fishing that her book uh, deals with is a problem and to educate, so to, to do an education, but also to work on her uh, creative practice to make it sustainable. And same, Bruno is looking at his uh, own fashion practice in, in ways that is less wasteful and and maybe uh, creating them on demand. And and uh, uh, Oscar is saying how his, his practice has changed as well uh, from looking at his uh, his own domestic environment. And and Tabitha, well, uh, he uh, she's uh, she's doing an internship now that is maybe taking her practice a little bit further into helping other industries to um, how to communicate uh, their you know their investigations and concerns so um, so basically this thinking through sustainability in creative practices if we can see in these examples that you uh, take your practice to a different level and you 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 think you can you can explore different ways of developing your practice it's very important yeah wonderful so thank you very much to you all it has been fantastic to have you on the show this is cambridge zero climate talks you can get in touch with our, on our email address which is info at zero.cam.ac.uk Luca, thank you very much for joining us today and for our audience would you mind telling us your name and what you do please hello everyone my name is luca marazzi uh, i'm research manager at earthwatch europe and i'm an aquatic ecologist and so my job is to study rivers lakes and other uh, aquatic bodies especially freshwater um, but it's all connected. So the rivers go to the ocean and today we're going to talk about uh, exactly that in relation to plastic pollution. Excellent. And for people that do not know, what does Earthwatch do? Yes, thanks for the question. Earthwatch is an environmental charity with the science at its heart. Uh, We connect people with the natural world, monitor the health of our natural resources and inform the actions that will have the greatest positive impact on the environment. Um, we work with scientists, businesses, civil society, and policymakers to drive the change that, that we need towards a more sustainable uh, world. So we are an independent research organization, uh, and we use science to uh, better understand, but also help solve the problems uh, around the world. Connect, in connection with the environment. So the, there's Earthwatch Europe, but there's also Earthwatch in the US where actually everything started in 1971. And then um, Hong Kong, India, Australia, and uh, Japan. And so, yeah, the, we are a little bit everywhere. So you mentioned rivers, and I understand you have a plastic rivers program. So can you expand on, on that, please? Yes, so our Plastic Rivers program aims to provide a detailed picture of where plastic pollution originates, so the causes, how it ends up in our waterways and in the ocean. There is one ocean. I like this fact that there's one ocean, if you think about it that way. And how we can help solve the problem in partnership with businesses, consumers, and policymakers. And so we give um, 
uh, practical evidence-based steps to tackle plastic pollution so that everyone can be part of the of the solution and we have just published a new scientific paper in the open source journal uh, plus one on last friday and um, so we, we concluded that the best things anyone can can do um, are to refuse non-necessary plastic items such as stra straws unless you need them of course for medical reasons second reduce dependence on traditionally single-use plastic items for example shampoo bottles you can refill and another bottle you have um, and uh, or buy larger bottles third you can replace plastic items with reusable and old alternative uh, products with a lower environmental impact and then well last and at least do not litter or flush down the toilet wet wipes sanitary towels and cigarette butts and or uh, and other non recyclable uh, items so to to remember it in a in a shorter form there are four r's refuse reduce reuse and recycle so to give you a bit of uh, context uh, did you know that if everyone in the uk switched to reusable water bottles we could reduce plastic pollution in our rivers and ocean by nearly 7000 tons and if you follow other advice that we give in the paper and uh, other organizations give uh, we could all reduce um, plastic pollution in the uk specifically by 25 thousand tons a year and uh, so that's a huge impact that we can have and i can tell you what the obstacles towards this goal though are a little bit and if you think about 28 different recycling arrow symbols uh, where you know consumers have to figure out what where to put uh, what and uh, does my council uh, recycle this or not and um, and so on so we need um, to call for a simplification of the information that we receive from uh, the authorities um, and also uh, you know the number and the quality of the bins and the waste management services uh, in our communities um, the, the impact that you, that you can have by by doing these things um, cannot be understated if there are enough bins if the bins don't overflow the food wrappers and bottles do not end up uh, in the local river or in the wrong um, canal and so on um, that does that is not treated uh, in the sewer system and uh, if you put stuff in the right bin you know you get turtles fish birds and whales and many more animals that can benefit from this because they will not be harmed by your choices uh, as consumers but there are good news the the article is all about what we can do uh, and uh, what we can do from now and uh, a lot of people are indeed uh, getting more and more active in litter picking uh, and engagement activities schools uh, involving kids uh, are obtaining good results at the local level by reducing plastic in their in their own facilities um, you know healthy eating makes us reduce plastics to plastics too it's a win-win you can learn to bake your own snacks if you think about it and even make your own fizzy drinks at home um, you have less sugar less plastics better health and also parliaments and governments in the uk uk uh, in the uk eu elsewhere as well are introducing various laws and measures to reduce single-use plastics for example deposit return schemes where you get money back for your plastic bottles these are very advanced in countries like Norway, for example. Uh, extended producer responsibility means that businesses have to collect, treat, and recycle their own waste. So it's not taxpayers' money. They have to do it, and it's going to be convenient for them if they do it. So every business, in summary, uh, person, authority, organization, have a, a role to play to reduce plastic use, incorrect disposal, and therefore pollution. It's all connected more environmentally sustainable choices um, can become new norms can become established as practices um, and um, if we all uh, implement them and if we give examples to our friends and so on indeed and actually i think people don't really realize when we talk about plastic pollution that river pollution i mean the rivers do end up at one point or another in the ocean and that's a big contributor to the plastic that 
or we find at sea. So can you tell us a bit more about the research into plastic pollution you're carrying at the moment? Yes, so this was the desk-based uh, research, if you want, where uh, me and my colleagues as scientists sit um, in the office and look at a lot of data and uh, make sense of it with the statistical analysis and then produce graphs, graphs and tables that you can read in our paper. But you can also read our blog, which is a summarized version, and it's easier for, for everyone. But then what we do, we go out in the environment and we work with volunteers in something called citizen science, which is basically uh, working with um, volunteers who collect data uh, with us as scientists who can uh, train them uh, how to do it the, the right way to get the robust data to better understand environmental issues and help um, solve the, the problem as well. So we work between research and engagement uh, teams and we have a, a project funded by um, SC Johnson, uh, one of our corporate partners in uh, Surrey and North Hampshire. And um, what I can tell you about that project is that we uh, recruited thanks to two wonderful voluntary action groups in uh, Central Surrey and uh, the Hart River area. Um, we recruited over 40 volunteers and more than 25 of them went out to collect data on how much plastic and what type of plastics there is on river banks, on four different rivers. And uh, this is one part of the research it's more field-based with the citizen scientists. The other part of the research is um, online. So it's a 10, 15 minute survey that over 1,200 people already responded to and filled and uh, you can join that. So uh, you'll find it at um, plasticfootprint.earthwatch.org.uk, plasticfootprint.org earthwatch.org.uk and uh, you can start it and interrupt it and uh, it's not going to disappear just do it in the bits of time that you have in, even on your phone and we'll be very happy to receive your data and maybe we'll see a spike uh, on your responses after this interview thanks to Antoinette. Yes, I was going to ask you, so what will you do with the data collected? I mean, you're focusing all on these particular rivers. So what, what are you hoping that you will get or planning? I can give you a snippet on our first finally findings uh, from the footprint calculator I just talked about. Uh, we are seeing that people often state that they don't face barriers to, to change their behaviors. And yet, when we ask them about what are you doing to reduce your plastic bottle use or your uh, cotton bud use or her other items is uh, and um, not enough of them um, say that they are already doing something so there's a problem between awareness and um, I want to do something and actually doing it. <laughs> um, and on the data collection side of things in along the rivers we found that food related items such as food wrappers uh, but also bottles and bags and smoking related items are most, uh, most abundant on riverbanks. So what we are doing with this uh, uh, data then is to compare what we find in the survey dealing with the, the behaviors that cause a problem and what we are finding with the volunteers data on the actual problem in the environment on the rivers, uh, on the riverbanks. And um, so my colleague Deb, Debbie Winton will be able to tell you more in the coming months about the results of this uh, survey and the citizen science uh, activity. But um, what we are finding uh, so far is that there's uh, some consistency between uh, prior data that we published uh, in the Plastic Rivers report that you can also find on our website and this last paper and another paper that Debbie and colleagues uh, published earlier this year. So it seems that you're focusing now much more on solutions, which that's what we need. And I mean, we always talk about the problem, but we never really talk about too much of the solutions that we need to have. So, for example, you mentioned earlier on on your paper that maybe making recycling symbols more accessible or maybe simplify them. That's a very good solution because you find a lot of people, they want to recycle, but they find it very complicated. Yes, that's absolutely correct. 
and uh, it's a big problem. So that's why we also work with um, uh, social scientists. I went to a, a great uh, workshop in November last year uh, when we could still go to conferences in person and meet people um, called the social life of plastics where a lot of social scientists um, uh, shared their, their work on uh, um, psychological and social dynamics that lead to uh, environmental problems as they are and also to the change that we need to uh, reduce these problems and uh, move towards a more sustainable future which is um, should be in everyone's mind. And talking about the future, if you had a magic wand to actually say this is what I would like to have in the future, what would your wish be? We as a researchers um, write uh, proposals to get projects uh, funded to do research and publish it and then um, communicate it with the general public. So we, um, we are trying to get um, projects uh, to, to work in the UK, but also for example in India, to be able to understand uh, why the pollution that is there is there in terms of plastics and what the local communities can, can do to change things from the bottom up, as it were, from the grassroots with local initiatives. So I would like to see an expansion of, of this movement towards uh, plastic free or perhaps better, more accurate, uh, plastic clever uh, societies. Uh, what I would like to see in the next five years uh, is definitely more funding for research on this problem and on the solutions. Uh, there is not enough uh, to support all the wonderful organizations and universities that work on this problem. And also the coalitions uh, to lobby for change, for example, the UK Plastic Pact, Plastics Pact, the Plastic Pollution Coalition and the New Plastics Economy of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that we are um, endorsers of. Uh, I would like them to um, well be able to get from the policymakers and politicians the actions and the speed of the actions that we are all uh, seeking to achieve. And Luca, when you mentioned plastic and how we can stop using plastic, what about the role of innovation? Are there any sort of alternative products or alternative ways that we could, should be looking at? Uh, yes, indeed. So the landscape uh, around bioplastics and sustainable plastics and, and so on, plastics that degrade very fast uh, in the soil or even better in the water. And um, But that's uh, um, the innovation in that uh, area and also the innovation in terms of recycling programs is too slow because uh, not enough of what's uh, being uh, used and produced in terms of plastic is recycled currently, really small percentages around the world. And so, for example, food wrappers are not widely recycled. Um, although people think that they are doing the right thing in putting, it, putting them in the recycling bin. Uh, the same goes with plastic cups uh, for coffee, for example. You have lining of um, plastics inside, and so you can't really uh, put them in the recycling bin. There are schemes, though. So in innovation, hopefully, um, is going to change things. And there have been uh, instances, like at the London Marathon, uh, there were these pouches where you drink uh, and eat the container <laughs> that you are drinking from. Um, but you know, from uh, prototype to application in uh, millions and billions of um, instances, it's the, the the long is really the the road is still long, and basically uh, there needs to be subsidies uh, from governments and um, more collaboration between businesses, maybe rather than uh, all going for uh, patents and uh, you know profits. Um, and uh, let me conclude with the. Uh, um, broadening up a little bit, uh, saying that plastic pollution is part of the uh, fresh water uh, and uh, marine aquatic uh, pollution. Nutrient pollution is another big issue. And um, Earth Watch, we have the Freshwater Watch uh, project that um, gathered uh, over 25,000 data points over uh, eight years or so. And we're going to have a late September water blitz that you can sign up to uh, on our website and with a 
kit that we can send you home, you're gonna be able to tell us how many nitrates and phosphates there are in your local rivers and canals. And if people wanted to receive the kit, will that be all available all over the UK? Everywhere in the UK and um, uh, also uh, we have water blitzes that are active in general abroad, uh, Luxembourg, Paris, uh, Ireland. And, but at the moment, um, there's a, still this issue with the lockdown and, 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 and so on. So you can monitor these other blitzes if you're not um, living in the UK currently but we are going to go ahead with the September water blitz. And um, um, so that's, uh, that's great news. Well, Luca, thank you very much for the interview today. It has been fantastic having you on and all the information. And we look forward as well to reading the, the new paper you published. Thank you so much, Antoinette. It was great meeting you in Cambridge at the workshop I, I mentioned. And uh, I wish you all the best for your uh, great work at Cambridge Zero. This is Cambridge Zero Climate Talks. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. So first of all, can you tell us your name and where you are at the moment and what you're planning to, to study? So uh, my name is Kiara. I'm actually in Wiltshire in the UK at the moment and um, I would like to study geography uh, in the future. Uh, good day, I'm Alan Saracharich, an aspiring engineer and I'm currently a rising year 12 student at the Graz International Bilingual School at Graz, Austria. Hi, I'm Simi. I am in Harrow in London and I'm hoping to study human, social and political sciences. Hi, I'm Mariella. I'm from Shropshire in England and I'm hoping to study history next year. Hi, I'm Shure. Um, I'm in Bexhill, so it's a town on the southeast coast of England. Um, I'm hoping to study engineering. I'm Gerline, I'm in the UK um, and I'm, I want to study law. Now, you're all here because you won the competition that we set up with Downing College about writing about your what you want to study and why it's important to issues of climate change. So what inspired you to submit your thoughts to the competition? So, Sharia? I thought it was a good opportunity to like learn more about the topic myself because it sort of like pushes you to learn stuff you don't know outside the curriculum. And something that's definitely relevant, obviously, especially with everything that's happened recently. So, yeah, that's basically why I wrote it. And what about you, Mariella? What inspired you? You're going to do history. So I thought it'd be really interesting because, first of all, the curriculum at school, when you learn, it doesn't really consider anything to do with the environment because at the end of the day, history is a study of humanity. And I thought it'd be really interesting to explore further into new areas of history, environmental history, which is not really taught in Britain anyway. And as I put in my um, entry, I was lucky enough to do some work experience at the Houses of Parliament. And it was very particular at the time. Um, and I went to go into the Environmental Audit Committee. It was, I found it interesting how um, they were talking about how car washes and how the explo exploitation of people and the environment always kind of coupled together. And I thought at the end of the day, history is the study of humanity. So it'd be really interesting to just explore further with that and maybe read some research papers on that aspect of history. Excellent. And what about you, Sumi? Never, never really like articulated my views on climate change before. And also I don't do politics for A-level. So I want to do politics at uni, so I thought it'd be a really good way for me to get involved in the debate of climate change and, you know, like define some of my political views as I'm still in the process of defining them. So it was a really good um, learning opportunity for me. Alan, I think you were next. Oh, what, it, what inspired me to take part in the competition is that I think that climate, climate change is a disaster occurring today. And um, it's already affecting large parts of the world by uncontrollable forest fires to droughts that are plaguing large parts of our world. And I think um, it's, it's very important to deal with it right now because studies show that the point of no return is expected to reach us by 2035. And I think engineers have the duty to innovate and halt this catastrophe. And while researching and taking part in the competition, I informed myself how engineers are already helping in this fight. 
Excellent. And Kiara? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, I'm sort of an aspiring geography student and climate change is sort of a, a fundamental uh, area in my discipline. So the slant I decided to take with my message was actually looking at an issue I feel is sometimes kind of overlooked in the kind of discussion about climate change. And that is sort of the disproportionate effect um, climate change will have on sort of our, our, the poorest in our societies over the world. So i.e. the inequality which is going to be sort of exacerbated by climate change so you know obviously climate change is going to affect all of us but it will affect you know the people who live in the sort of most vulnerable areas and who can't afford the materials to rebuild after climate shocks probably you know first and the hardest and this sort of idea about inequality, which I wanted to kind of explore in my, my message, it doesn't just, uh, you know, happen between nations, it's also within them. So through these competitions, it kind of struck me that all of us together are going to have to put our kind of multidisciplinary weight behind this sort of case for change. Um, and I think, you know, especially as we are the generation that will have to kind of solve the climate change issue, um, you know, I think... There's a, a lot to think about, definitely, but that's what I was trying to get across in my message. <laughs> what about you, girl? What inspired you to write? Um, so I think everyone knows that climate change is becoming more and more prevalent. And what inspired me was that I believe because it gave me the opportunity to recognise the role that I will have to play in the future, because I believe that every industry, every professional and every individual will have their role to play in climate change. As um, a future lawyer, I believe that law also has a huge role to play because legislation will need to change in, in response to climate change. And I think recognizing that role was, uh, is really important. And yeah, I know that legislation will change, but also the way society interacts with the courts will change, like all of that will change. But also, you know, um, as climate, ch um, because of climate change, natural disasters will intensify. And because of that, some governments will not have the resources to meet basic human rights. And in those cases, the courts will need to intervene. And yeah, so that was really the reason why I took part in this competition. And do you think that the school curriculum has enough or does it cover enough about climate change or is it really something that you would like to see and it's not being done yet? Maria, let's start with you. Uh, I think the history, which is my subject, a lot of the school curriculum is dealing with history as a humanity. So I've read a lot about what, how history can be used. And a lot of what we study is just, um, yeah, this happened and this, this is what happened to these people. And it's very kind of contextualized in that time. But also I've read that some historians consider history as a social science. So something which can be used to, um, uh, look at the past to be able to contextualize today and be able to help today's problems and um, I think something's called his placing today as the historical process so at the end of the day where we are with climate change is just a result of humanity's past uh, actions but we haven't looked at that at all in in our history studies anyway about maybe because for example for a level i'm doing the spanish civil war we don't look at even we don't contextualize it within spain today it's literally just yeah this was the spanish civil war this is what happened and i think that's a problem and it's somewhere that history can be taken where even just looking maybe at certain uh, situation how did that affects the environment even in that time and then maybe look at it in the historical process and how that can be um, damaging to the environment today. Excellent and Sharir what about in your area? I don't, I don't study engineering at A level but I study physics and maths and further maths so but in physics I think we, le we learn about like renewable fuels etc and stuff like that but we don't um, sort of talk about the problems that are like further down the line so in my essay I talk about um, sort of like fuels, we need to find a more energy dense fuel than uh, so we can, which is also deemed sustainable. Um, so one of the things that's possible maybe is hydrogen fuel, so hydrogen fuel cells, but we don't, so like we may learn about this in school, but what we don't learn is like how, like the problems that arise with it kind of, and maybe even also with batteries. It's like we can use batteries which are deemed sustainable, 
but because of the problems that arise with power, so like power varies with mass squared, and because batteries are less energy dense, you obviously need a higher power requirement. So we don't, we don't learn about like specific case studies, and I think that would be very beneficial um, just to sort of contextualize it again. Um, and what about you, Simi? Same question. As I said earlier, I don't do politics or sociology or anything at A-level, um, so I'm not too familiar with the curriculums. But I remember uh, in like biology GCSE when we'd learn about global warming, I was, I'm just thinking that they obviously give like a brief overview of what it is and the effects and whatever, but I don't think the curriculum really portrays the severity of the actual problem that is happening today. Um, so I think the gravity of the problem is something that needs to be emphasized, especially with our generation, you know, like education is so important, awareness is so important. So I think, yeah, there needs to be a change. What about you, Gurleen? Same question. Um, I don't study law and I know that law A-level is very different to studying law um, as a degree subject. But I think I would say overall, um, I definitely agree with, with the fact that the gravity of the situation is not emphasised enough in the curriculum. But also, there isn't, an enough, there isn't enough emphasis on the fact that every profession has a part to play. Because I think some people, um, I think some people might be under the illusion that oh, okay, only scientists have to do something about it, or it's only the environmentalist's job. But no, I think every profession has, has a part to play. So I think that should be more um, emphasised in the curriculum so that students can feel more empowered, that no matter what they do, they will be able to do something towards climate change. In Austria, what about the curriculum? Is it sort of very similar to the UK or is it a bit different? So the educational system is pretty different. We have a fixed base curriculum and we can pick electives. And I think in the base curriculum, we have subjects such as geography and English, where um, we talk about climate change a lot. We read articles and we inform ourselves how current, how big of a current problem it is. And there are some electives we can pick, which are particularly for climate change, climate. And I think um, in a lot of electives uh, we can pick, they try to touch upon climate change in a different way. So I, I believe that in Austria, uh, it is touched upon a bit, but I think there's always room for improvement yeah and what about Kira? same question yeah, again i kind of agree with what everybody said um i'm lucky because geography as i mentioned it's quite a climate change does come into it a lot but it's sort of you know the issue of climate change is sometimes sort of tacked on to the end of a topic and i think there is definitely room to sort of uh, you know you know stress it more almost so you know we should be able to do at least one whole topic on climate change looking at you know everything to do with it and i think it is quite important to as everyone has said uh, to integrate it into all subjects um, as well because you know we all have an effect on it we're all we all need to educate ourselves about it because it's an issue we're going to have to deal with so yeah I think obviously I'm quite lucky where I am and what my field of study is but um, there, as Alan said there's always room for improvement so yeah. <laughs> well thank you very much to you all it has been wonderful to have you on the show and expressing your views. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well Amy have a lovely weekend and chat next week then.